So good morning to all that have just joined us and to anyone that might be watching the replay on this, a hello to you. Welcome to another one of our online learning webinars. This time it's all about wood, de wood destroying fungi in buildings. I am your host, Andy Ferguson, and joining me today, I'm again pleased to welcome back PCA CEO Steve Hodgson. We are about to start the main presentation. Now, for all those that have just joined us, if you do want to pose a question over the course of the webinar, I'll just point you to the chat facility, either on your left or the right hand side on the desktop. If you are using a mobile, all you need to do is simply pull it up. Or if you just want to email me your question, just email it at andy at property-care.org. Well, Steve, I'm just looking at the time here. Um, it looks like we're um, nicely just at nine o'clock. So, Steve, wood destroying fungi in buildings. What risks do the you know, what risks do they actually pose? Why does it become a problem? And what potential damage do they do? And how do we prevent this from happening in the future? I know you've got some cracking insights, Steve, and some cracking pictures to share. So I suppose over to yourself, good sir. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I need to get this to be able to change first. Um, uh, my name is Steve Hodgson. I'm, I'm, I'm CEO of the PCA. I've been around for, for quite a long time. Um, I've had lots of experience working on site as before I, I joined the association and certainly did my best to try and keep my hand in even now, um, though unfortunately I don't get to visit that many sites anymore. Um, one of the things that I do do, though, still is still have an oversight of um, technical questions and queries, and um, I'm also involved at the periphery of, of, of construction complaints, um, disputes, and that sort of stuff. Which, which actually is a, an incredibly interesting place to, to 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 pick up knowledge and 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 do stuff. Now, today, what what I'm going to do is 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 not try and present some impenetrable, difficult, highly technical romp through fungal decay. W what I'm going to try and do is break it all down. This is this is not a slide that's uh, a slide presentation or a, or a slide show that's designed for people at the you know the pinnacle of the career as mycologists. This is this is about understanding in a in an accessible and reasonable way about the nature of fungal decay, how it affects buildings, why it's a, a serious problem, but 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 why it's also very simple to to, to actually remedy and and, and resolve. Um, so these are these are a few photographs that I took um, on Sunday morning, um, walking the dog with the kids. Um, fungal decay is everywhere. Um, wood grows, wood rots. Um, the fact is that fungal decay is is absolutely essential to life. Without fungus, without uh, the, the mycology that breaks things back down from their grown state into their digestible state, um, the, the world would stop working as we know it. So fungus and fungal decay is very natural, very common, and absolutely essential. Now, for me, and this is not pulled out of an exercise book, this is the, this is the world according to, to you know, my own um, ill-educated theories, but Timber has kind of two or, or three normal states. You have wood that's growing and wood that's rotting. And somewhere in the middle, you have timber that's stable, that is preserved in its ungrowing state before it goes rotten. Because there's only one sure thing about wood that's grown that eventually it will rot. And what we're trying to do is, is hold timber in that middle state, in that preserved state, in that state where fungal decay and insect attack is either minimized, reduced or prevented. So we can take advantage of all the structural traits of that lumber um, in our buildings. And, and this is this is for me a great photograph of a, of a property that of a building that I looked at um, for a mate in Spain. Um, it's a barn and it's very old and the timbers are very old. Um, but what has been done, it's a perfect example of how they've taken timber and it's built of nothing else other than timber and a few a few bits of stone and figured out how they can keep the weather off it, keep the water off it, shed the shed any water that does fall off it and keep the sweet chestnut that it's built out of in good condition and, and free from decay. And it kind of works. Where it fails, it's also eminently repairable. 
So you can take components out and put new bits in. They also understood when they built these things um, about durability, which timbers do better and um, decay slower and um, are more um, able to, 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 to work in things like ground contact. So the main structural elements of this are built in, in sweet chestnut, for example. So, so that, that, that's an understanding of how, how wood rots. But put very simply, this is how it works. Um, if you have water and you have wood, you have rot. And it's a, it's a, it's a very, very simple equation. Um, so where does the water come from? Um, in buildings, we know all of these things. These are our stock in trade. You have water that gets in through the roof. You get plumbing leaks, condensation, high ground, water penetration. All of those things cause water to come either in contact with the masonry structures or within or, or there and then in contact with uh, with with the timber that's embedded, usually embedded in it. Um, and so these are the points of uh, points at which we get wetness. So the, the evidence of that, 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 that water ingress, as we've just said, is things like mold growth, deterioration of finishes. Um, you see liquid water on surfaces with condensation, that sort of stuff. Staining, efflorescence, timber decay. That's the bit we're after today. Fungal decay, timber decay. The fact that, that the organisms could get in there and start to bio degrade, ingest, eat the wood. We also get... Um, Timber distorts and all the rest of it. The other thing that's kind of missing off that is is also insect attack, which is part of what James talked about a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. So internal damp comes generally from occupation and from the services that are in the building, and external damp comes from a whole host of things. But you know that relatively small list kind of covers most instances. Defective gutters, running overflows, poor pointing, raised ground levels, cracked render. Stuff on the, on the outside of the building that fails, that are defective, that allows the fabric to get wet and water to travel through. Now, this, these are similar whether we're talking about a, you know the photograph here, which is a, a local authority house somewhere. Um, local to us that had a, a, an, is, an issue with a with an overflow pipe. It, it doesn't matter whether it's that or whether it's a timber frame building the Cotswolds. The fact is, it won't be Cotswold timber frame, but you take my point. If the fabric is defective, then that allows wetting up. And if that wetting up takes place, it gives an opportunity for decay and, 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 and degradation of the structures. So from occupation, Where's the occupation water come from, from breathing and cooking and evaporation? But here's a question for you. Um, here's the first one of our, our, our kind of mini polls, if you like, and Andy will probably ping up your option to press a button in a second. But is condensation an important consideration when thinking about rot in, 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 in structural components? We often think about condensation as being something that is a nuisance and associated with mold growth and that sort of stuff. But is it important in regards to in, in regards to, to, to timber decay? What do you think? Well, yes, folks, it is. Well, folks, the poll is there in front of everyone just at the moment. I'm just going to keep up for about another five, six seconds there. Uh, if you're on a mobile, you might need to pull up your screen. Um, so just five, four, three, two, one. I'm just going to end the poll. And it was pretty much 95% of people said yes, Steve. Well, um, thank heavens for that. Um, the, the, fact with con the fact is with condensation that mostly it's associated with surface problems and mould. But if you understand a little bit about timber, you'll also know that it is hydroscopic. So it, in the same way as construction of salts in construction can absorb moisture from the air. Timber wants to absorb moisture from the air. And even though if you keep it wet from condensation for short periods of time, there's generally not going to be a problem. If it remains wet for, for protected period of times, of course, it's just a water molecule. The, the fungus doesn't know where it's come from. And so if things remain wet for protracted period, long periods of time due to condensation or high atmospheric moisture levels, then decay can become established. There doesn't have to be huge amounts of liquid water for that to happen. Um, so yeah, and it, it, it's it's important. The one thing that 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 is again, I, I know I keep repeating this, and we'll get on to some really good fair photographs in a minute or two when we start looking at the particular funguses in detail. But fungus needs a lot of water. 
it, it, if you rob it of that water, the, the fungus will stop growing. It needs quite considerable amounts of water to, to keep its um, to keep to keep itself healthy. So where does it get this water from? Um, there are a few kind of not they're not unique, but they're kind of atypical things that I've tried to draw out. Timbers are often built into masonry structures. So if the masonry structures get wet, they'll transfer the water into joist ends, into the structures that are there. So joist ends, spar feet, rafters, wall plates, lintels are all susceptible to decay where they're bearing into, where they're, where they're in contact with that, with that wetness. And so that's often the place as surveyors, you spend a lot of time looking. You look at those bearing ends, you look at that stuff. Now, the, 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 the other thing, of course, is that brings in the earlier um, notes about actually where do you start an inspection for decay you always start an inspection for decay with the external fabrics um, because if there are if there are evidence of defects on the e e external elevations of a building there are those leaking gutters there are those um, overflow pipes there are blocked air bricks they will give you clues as to, as to as to the risks that the building may be under from 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 decay and so they they kind of help you they educate you to as to as to where to look so this is evidence of, of water that's come through a roof. Um, this is a result of a leak. Um, it's nothing to do with a structural issue. Um, and you can see how the, how the decay is, is a long way from those masonry structures, which gives you an indication that actually you're looking for something other than water ingress that's coming solely through the, 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 external, the external leaf. This is a roof leak, as it turns out, not one of my photographs. And I'll give all the credit to, all, to, to most. I think I've got most of them um, on the final slide, because um, this, this, this presentation is only possible due to the, the generosity of the people that, that, that actually supplied many of these images. So this is a evidence of decay um, caused by condensation. By atmospheric moisture. So again, you can just about see on the right hand side, or the left hand side, you can see that I pulled a screwdriver and popped a piece out the side of the joist. That's not in contact with the wall. You can also see how badly that joist has dropped against the brickwork as well. And that's on the left hand side. On the light right hand side, you can see that the, the, the that we have a joist there that's actually decayed along its length. You see it's split and there's cracks and there's fissures. That's as a result of, of it being in a, in, a, in a condition in the atmosphere that has allowed that timber to be wet enough for decay to, to, to be there and, 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 and remain, um, remain active. Now, the other, the other form of decay, of course, is where you have direct exposure to the external elements. So um, external joinery, um, window frames, um, fascias and soffits all decay in this way um, and that's often because they are the the, the, the timber that's being used is r relatively doesn't have high levels of natural durability um, often they're treated but if you get water that starts to get in behind the paint coats or the finishes and sits there for a long time it can't cycle out it can't dry out then decay can be accelerated quite quickly and even timbers that are um, that, that, that have low durability that are susceptible that even have some pretreatment um, can rot out reasonably quickly um, there are ways to protect these things of course but um, this is not an uncommon sight um, and, you know, the, the, the photograph that is the one in the background, the decay in that window bottom there and that windowsill had resulted in water running down inside the cavity on that bay and causing a much more serious problem with um, dry rot circular on the internal faces. So always pay attention to those external um, defects, um, even when they, they may look superficial, they, they may be, they'll be causing much more serious, serious things inside. So. First thing we're going to look at um, is is circular dry rot, um, and this is often the thing that kind of you know puts fear into surveyors' hearts and makes um, property owners um, cringe and, and run faster than if they had Japanese knotweed in their garden. Um, but dry rot, dry rot's just a fungus, the same as any other. It does have, however, some pretty interesting characteristics. Um, it produces quite interesting, large um, brown fruiting bodies that produce majillions of spores. Um, they produce huge numbers in relatively short spaces of time. Um, like any other fungus, um, it requires 
quite a large amount of water and you, surveyors should not be fooled by the name. Um, dry rot does not mean that dry rot can survive and prosper in, in relatively dry conditions. The, the name has more to do with the characteristics of the wood after it, 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 it has been affected by dry rot rather than the growing conditions required for the fungus. So don't be fooled by by the name. It's 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 kind of a bit misleading. In many respects, it, it it's just the same as any other. Here's another great photo. Um, not mine, I have to say, but the credits are at the end. Thank you, Adi. In the right conditions, circular dry rot can be very, very, um, very, very vigorous. It tends to get off to a relatively slow start. It needs to it needs to kind of build itself up to a position where it can start to romp. And so, what you see often with um, with incidents like fires or floods or or, or 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 heavy amounts of water ingress, immediately after the incident, there is there are all sorts of um, fungi that that can take up residence early. Um, like in cap and that sort of stuff. But generally, if, if it's allowed to stay damp for a long period of time, if there's water encapsulated in the timbers and that, in, in the masonry and, 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 and the conditions are not rectified rapidly, then those sorts of buildings after a few months, you can start to see some evidence of dry rot. If they're not picked up and nothing's happened and nothing's been done to, 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 to move the conditions of the building out of that kind of susceptible risk area, dry rot can really start to romp. And this is where the, you know, the horror stories about, well, it, you know, it moves every feet every month and all that kind of stuff come. Well, it, it, it can, the mycelium can move very quickly in search of, um, in search of new food if conditions are right. So what is it like? Dry rot likes, um, it, it needs water, it needs food, generally likes quite still conditions. And the other thing that dry rot really likes, and, and, and I've never seen it grow without it, is some degree of masonry contact or ground contact. Now, um, one of the things that, um, that, that, that that I was always told is that it needs some degree of calcium and it gets that from, from the surrounding environment. It can't get that from the timber. Now, I'm not a mycologist by, by, by profession, but I, 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 I think whatever the mechanism that is required or whatever the fungus needs, that's certainly that ground contact is one of those things that if you have fungus that looks a bit like dry rot, you've got lots of white mycelium, but you don't have it, but it's in the middle of a floor. You don't have ground contact. Kind of work it back. Make sure you're sure of your of your diagnosis. Now, one of the things that you hear quite a lot is, oh, you've been in a house with lots of dry rot, um, or you, 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 you're then worried about going home. So here's another little question for you. Can dry rot be introduced by coming into contact with, by, by you coming into contact with spores and then taking them somewhere else? What do you think? What do you think? Oh, folks, just feel free if you want to comment and just go into the chat functionality and stick it in there. If you have any opinions. There we go. I don't think anyone's really chatting here just at the moment in time, Steve. I, I, I think the poll question that we actually had was, can dry rot grow outside? Do you want me to release it? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, uh, OK. Oh, oh, that's not the same question that I've got. No. <laughs> um, well, we, we, we can ask that question, but let's ask it in the right place. Um, can grow dry rot grow outside? <laughs> it was on the next slide. Well, there you go, folks. I mean, we will get this right. We just not had enough coffee this morning, but there should be a poll now just up in front of you, everyone. Um, again, if you're on the mobile, you might need to pull it up. I'm just going to hold it up just for about another five seconds or so. I can see that um, my words, it's um, changing back and forth. I don't want to say the results. I'm tainting it, but another three two, one, and I'm just going to end the poll there. Um, Steve, interesting result. 53% said yes, 42% said no, 4% unsure. Well, um, it kind of, uh, and the, 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 the poll's pretty good, actually, pretty accurate, I guess, of, of kind of where, where, where the, the nondescript answer I'm going to give to the, to the question sits. Um, some years ago, I, I, I sat, um, and watched a lecture by a, um, a guy called Jajit Singh, who claimed to have discovered dry rot growing in the environment in the Himalayas. Um, and there was there was an awful lot of 
kind of you know back slapping that they found this dry rock growing outside in in in, in the mountains now I, I am not sure you know on reflection how they discovered that that dry rot was the source of the of the dry rot that, that affects all the houses across western europe um and and how they knew that the houses across western europe hadn't actually spread to the hills of the Himalayas, but that's a whole nother thing. The fact is that it can be found growing outside in certain conditions, um, but it don't like exposure. The other thing that I've seen it uh, on a couple of occasions, and this is not one of those occasions, isn't this photograph, this is somebody, somebody else has supplied this photograph to me. I have seen um, fruiting bodies growing on the outside of structures. One of them was at a place in Shooters Hill in London, which was absolutely spectacular. But unfortunately, I didn't have a camera with me. Um, and I wasn't local to Shooters Hill to go and take some more pictures, to go back and take pictures. Um, but 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 it, if, if you have a, a particularly bad dry rot infection inside, it's pretty vigorous, all the rest of it, I have seen dry rot come to the surface but it won't survive very long. It doesn't do very well. I haven't seen large mycelial growths on the outside. All I've seen is, 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 is brackets and fruiting bodies, um, but it's always worth a look. If you've got this sort of thing going on, you know you've got a lot going on inside. So here's another example um, of a photograph supplied by um, a guy called Dave Cook of Cook Group. Um, and he took these photographs a few years ago. What's going on here? It's a, it's a plumbing leak. The plumbing leak um, has been left unchecked. The timbers underneath the floor are very wet. Um, ground conditions are perfect. And what's kind of quite cool is you can see on the right hand side um, of the one with the lavatory sort of in, in, in kind of further away on the left hand photograph, you can see that the mycelium started to grow up between the cracks in the plasterboard. Um, and that's because you know if you're kind of switched on that you'll have a, a, a timber frame wall or a, a stud wall and the, the dry rot shooting up that, 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 that stud wall. And that's the thing with dry rot. That's the real differentiator with dry rot is it can grow away from the source of moisture to a degree. Um, sometimes that the, the level at which it can grow away is, is slightly overstated, but the fact is it can move away from the source of water. Can it go through walls? Um, this isn't a I, I don't, I, this isn't a poll question, but can it grow through walls? As well, a poll it, question, you do have oh, a poll question. <laughs> oh well, we've got we probably we probably got too many poll questions. Let's make this the last one, otherwise we'll be here till till doomsday. No problem. Well, can yeah, dry rock go through walls? There we go. Well, folks, you can feel free to answer. Do you think dry rock can grow through walls? It is up in front of you just at this moment in time. We'll make this just very, very quick. So I'm just going to keep it up for another couple of seconds. If you want to answer it, please feel free. Um, so three, two, one, and I'm ending it now. Um, Steve, you'll be pleased to say that 97% said yes. Okay, well, it, it can grow through gaps in walls. Yeah. Um, it can grow through cracks. It won't go through solid bricks unless there's, there's sufficient cracks in, in order to get the, the hyphae to grow through those. But, but it will happily grow through um, if, if, a, if a wall is, is wet and, um, and, it's, uh, and, and it's in the right conditions and there are cracks or fissures that allow the, the hyphae to grow through them, then yes, it will. It won't go through good concrete. It won't go through good uh, solid engineering bricks if there are no cracks and fissures. However, what you have to understand is that the, the amount of space that is needed for them to grow through is minute. So in all effects, actually, yes, it does grow through. It does grow through most brickwork um, quite happily. Um, and that's one of the things that you have to be really careful of with dry rot is that if you're looking at the conditions like this in, in an old coal cellar, what's going on in the property next door? So the chances are, if you're trying to eradicate a problem like this, one of the really big concerns, if you're a, if you're responsible for, for providing advice on eradication, is what's going on next door, what's going on in the property after that, even. What you know, have you really got to the source of the moisture? Because that really is the critical element to, to control. It's not anything else other than understanding the, the, the point at which the water is getting in, the water that it's using to thrive, grow, um, procreate, do its stuff. If you do not eliminate that water, you're never going to get rid of the problem. You're just going to, you're just going to bump it down the track a bit. So control, eliminate the water source, allow the structure to dry. And I mean, like as far as you possibly can, um, 
you have to remove defective or weakened timbers. You, the whole idea of stripping back to a meter is very 1970s. Um, you use the skill and the knowledge of the specialist to, to be able to determine how much you can save and how much you can't. Now, it says kill, kill with chemical preserves is when appropriate. Now, I'm, I am an advocate of the use of chemical herbicides or chemical fungicides, but they must be used in a targeted, responsible way. Um, they are very good for giving you a buffer for drying. They're very good in order to knock growth back quickly, but they are not a long term solution to a water ingress problem that's caused decay. The only solution is the management of the water source. Rebuild and re rebuild to reduce risk. Now, this is something that's kind of often overlooked. Now, amongst the specialist community, these are the things that, that come naturally. So rather than build joists back into a wall, you build them on a dwarf wall and you pull them away from the masonry structures if there's continued risk. You improve ventilation. You change the design, perhaps, of a parapet that's leaked a couple of times and caused decay. You think about eliminating timbers from susceptibly wet areas. Those things are kind of, they come as, 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 a, as a natural consequence of understanding the decay, but they're often overlooked by, by, by amateurs or general builders. And the idea of monitoring and maintenance is, is, is absolutely critical too. If, if a building has been affected by dry rot, it is more susceptible to, to future dry rot outbreaks, not because the spores are there and they lurk about. The fact is that if you have spores out there and they're blowing around all over the place, they're kind of omnipresent. If you have the right conditions, then, 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 then you have a, 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 a risk of growth. What you do know is if a building has been affected by dry rot once, then the conditions have been right for decay once. And so if they're not, not amended, then the chances are that those conditions will come back unless the building is well, well maintained. So actually monitoring and maintaining buildings that have been affected by dry rot is, is really pretty important. Wet rots. Let's talk about wet rots for a little bit. Um, most common are Aconiforia and Fibroporia. Um, but what do we really know about these fungi? Um, they kind of do most of the damage. Um, they're all over the place. We see them both, uh, you know, in garden structures and occasionally, unfortunately, um, destroying timbers in our houses. Um, they kind of need the same sorts of things um, as, as, as dry rot. They need, they need water. Um, but you know, we've got a picture of, of mycelium of, of, of conifora on the wall. Um, they have fruiting bodies, they have spores, they have mycelium, they require water. Um, they they, they, they cannot survive without lots of water. Um, same as before. Um, the one thing that I will, the reason I put this slide in is because sometimes actually you can give them too much water. Um, all fungi need a bit of a window. They they do do well at a particular particular moisture content. If 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 they become too saturated with water, then generally the the, the fungal decay will stop growing. It will stop happening. Um, what usually happens, however, is that at some point that moisture level will reduce a little bit. And as that water level reduces, that pushes them back into the window for the decay. There are usually some, you know, it's usually kicking about in either a dormant state or it's a suboptimal state of growth. It will come back all the stronger and all the harder when 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 you go back into that into that window for growth. So, um, you know, let's not try and um, preserve timber by keeping it wet unless you're yeah, looking after the Mary Rose. Um, so wet rots again. They don't like dry conditions. They will they will um, arrest their their growth very quickly. Um, now there's another question: Can dry, dry rot, wet rots grow outside? Um, well, we won't do the poll. We'll just answer the question. But yes, absolutely, of course they can. Um, the photographs earlier of the window frames, um, thinking about soffits and fascias, um, thinking about what happens to the to the baseboards in your in your garden shed. Of of course they can grow outside. They're very 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 common in 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 the environment. Um, you know, it's a little photograph of of, of just a a piece of, uh, of edging timber um, on a piece of render. God only knows why it's there, but you can see it rots out very very happily timber window frames, that sort of stuff. Right, um, you know, question is what's happening here? Um, this, is a, this is a job I looked at a few years ago, um, subject of a 
TV program, but you've got an internal gutter um, and you've got water coming in through damage to that gutter um, and it's valley gutter and you've got all sorts going on. The water is running straight down onto the on, onto the wall plate, into the spa feet, very large scale timbers. Um, what was kind of quite cool with this particular building was um, the level of decay, the level of de damage was not cool, but but the fact is that there was just about everything going on here. So there was porias, there were um, conifera, um, so cellar fungus and mine fungus. There was also dry rot elsewhere in the building. But the really interesting part about th this particular building is there was active death watch as well. Um, you can't actually see it very well there, but um, there were there, there were active death wash grubs that we could pull out of the timber and see them wriggling about in the palms of our hands. Um, so yeah, very interesting. Now the thing is that this is water ingress at a high level, and this is close to the point of water ingress. So the the, the rate and the damage that that's obvious and evident is is quite severe. The one thing that a surveyor must understand is that water is very seldom static when there's lots of it kicking about. So you have to follow it down through the structure and find out where it's got to and how much damage that, that that's occurred. So yeah, we've got damage in these spark feet and these beams. Um, unfortunately, the damage went straight the way down um, a vertical timber element as well and also took out all the intersecting beams too. So, a, a, there's lots of questions, they're not all subject to a poll, but but can you tell the difference between wet rots and dry rots, uh, between different kinds of rots? Um, you know, here's a here's a really interesting shot of um, of a fungus. What, what does that look like to you? Um, is that dry rot? Is that wet rot? Um, the question really is, um, does it matter? Um, does it really matter that 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 actually precise um, mycological um, diagnosis isn't always done. If you think back to what we've been describing, the causes of decay are always the same. It, it's water and it's vulnerable timber. And so, you know, the only thing that's in doubt potentially with a diagnosis is not why it's rotten, but what the rot is. We then think about um, we then think about, sorry, we then think about the the, 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 the damage that is done and the, the mechanisms for damage. Well, the damage is kind of the same. It degrades the timber. It causes it to fail. It brings on structural collapse and failure. So, so how much does it really matter? There's been an awful lot of stuff throughout my career and certainly in my early career where, you know, dry rot was terrible, wet rot was easy to sort out. Well, actually, dry rot's just as easy to sort out as wet rot if you can totally eliminate the cause of, 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 of decay. The only thing, that's the water. The only thing that's a bit, bit different with wet rot, or with dry rot rather, is that ability to move. So you have to look beyond the, 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 the timber or masonry contact, or the masonry contact. You have to start thinking logically about how that building is, is, is constructed, where hidden timbers may be, and all of that. That said, is that that very much different than the photograph we looked at a couple of slides ago where we've got water ingress at high level and we've got as surveyors to understand the mechanisms and the processes that allow that water to run through the structure and think about what it's rotting further down the building. So actually, you know, yeah, I will concede that there is this idea that dry rot can move in three dimensions and go up as well as down, whereas wet rots generally move downwards from the source of ingress. So that's really the only difference, in my view. Dry rot can be a bit more persistent, um, but 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 the fact is that the, the basic principles are the same: eliminate the water source. Now, I think this was um, this was the, the was a poll question, Andy. Um, so, based on what I've just said, as surveyors, do you worry more about wet rot or dry rot? Which is the thing that keeps you awake at night? What do you worry most about missing? Well, just to let you know, folks, this isn't actually a poll question, but I am keen to hear what <laughs> <laughs> it is. So here, guys, tell us what you think. Uh, why don't you go to the chat and tell us what you would worry about most. Would you worry about dry rot most or would you worry about wet rot? Now, me being a non-techie here, um, I actually for once know the answer, but we'll wait and see what everyone else comes through with. 
So, um, Steve, I don't know if you can see the chat or anything like that, but I am really chuffed to say that 100% is dry rot. But there is a couple really? of people in team, both. both yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, if, 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 if somebody had asked me when I was kind of out there in practice doing work and said, what, I, what, what would I work, worry about most? I, I, I would absolutely have totally agreed. Um, and, and it's easy for me to say from um, the comfort of my ivory tower that, that actually, um, if I was back out there in practice, I'd probably worried about, worry about them equally. They both do damage. Um, they are both, um, they're both types of fungal decay that, that, that survive with water contact. Um, th the fact is that it doesn't matter whether it's wet rot or dry rot or whatever it is, or the, or, or the initial clues that give you an indication that water ingress may be taking place. The diligence of the surveyor is about spotting the problem and understanding the risk, the risk factors that lead you to a, to, to a solid diagnosis. So mist dry rot can be more expensive than a bit of mist wet rot, but the fact is that, you know, you as a surveyor, you've got an obligation to spot de defects and decay, whatever it is. Um, the fact is that once you get into the treatment cycles, that if you really break it down to its basic elements, the fact is that I've seen jobs that are as big for treatments of defects with wet rot as I have with massive jobs where they've got big dry rot outbreaks. Um, I, I, I have to say that personally, I, I, I really like dry rot. I always have. I think it's an amazing fungi that does kind of quite amazing things and is spectacular sometimes to look at. Some of the some of the out outbreaks of dry rot that I've been lucky enough to see um, kind of really kind of excite me, which is kind of weird, I know. But, um, but the fact is when you really break it down, wet rot, dry rot, it's just a decay in a building. And actually they both should be things that you're concerned about because the damage and the structural in, implications of both um, are kind of not dissimilar, not dissimilar. So I got a picture on the picture on the screen. What's that? And I'm, I'm sure that most of you will know that that's Pazizer. Um, I just thought I'd put a couple of interesting photographs up. Um, this was something that was the subject of some discussion on one of the surveyors forums um, a little while ago. So I thought I'd bang a picture up and show you a bit of Pazizer. Pazizer, or otherwise known as Elk Cup, um, is very common in incredibly wet conditions. Um, they're, they're early colonizers, but you can often find them inside on bits of wet plasterboard where you've had a plumbing leak, where you've had a, a very, very severe ongoing roof leak. Um, they don't like they don't like periods of desiccation. Um, but what you can see is if you get cycling of water in a building where it gets wet and dry, very wet and very dry and very wet and very dry, is that you can often see elf cup that grows and then desiccates out and withers and dies. And then you get a new blush of, of, of elf cut when it gets wet again. So if you ever see this, it's an absolute doozy that, um, that, that, that you've got a lot of water kicking about, probably too much um, for, for some of the other decays. And here's another one. Um, here's another, just an interesting photograph, really. Um, this is a this is donkey offera. This is um, what they call okrot, um, the common name. Um, but if you, uh, I, I kind of like the, pho the photograph because um, it, it quite nicely illustrates that whole poria thing. So one of the ways of telling um, those fluffy white wet rot outbreaks from dry rot outbreaks is to look at the pores in the in 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 the in the in the the, the, the the mycelium itself. So you can see those little pits um, on that on that on that fungus. Um, that's that's common to the porias. It's it's not common to the to the circular to the dry rots. Um, so I just thought I'd chuck those in. So fungal decay. Primary measures when you're talking about control. Locate and eliminate whether this is dry rot or wet rot. Locate and eliminate the sources of moisture and promote rapid drying um, of the structure and hang fire as long as you can um, with, with, with reinstatement if you've got an opportunity to dry. Term the full outbreak, uh, extent of the outbreak, always. And that will often require um, destructive opening up. And that doesn't really matter whether it's wet rot or dry rot. Um, dry rot, very important, of course. 
wet rot if you understand precisely where the water ingress is perhaps it can be a little more limited but it's really important that you shouldn't be shy of opening up um, you're gonna have to do it anyway so you might as well get on and do it at the point of inspection or kind of get people to understand that that's the best way for them to really understand the implications of what they've got in their homes or their businesses or their, 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 their properties um, Remove the rotted wood, um, treat all risk timbers with preservatives. Now, at risk timbers. Now, I, I put at risk in, in, in exclamation marks because it's not a case of reading in a book what timbers might be at risk. It really is down to the assessment and the understanding of what's going on site as to what's at risk and what isn't. Um, so you can use timber preservatives, both the buffer to, for drying, for reinstatement, and also to protect at-risk timbers during that drying period. Use preservative treated replacement timbers, always an advocate of that. Why not? You can do it. It's safe, it's sustainable, and certainly will increase the, the, the usable life of timbers. There are some exceptions with particularly dense and durable wood, um, but no reason why you shouldn't use um, pre-treated timber, particularly if you're using um, low durability softwoods for reinstatement um yeah um and and, and that's kind of really it um if you are interested in um a little bit of further reading um pca produce we produce a, a a number of documents that are out there in the world so you can probably recognize some of the photographs that are on these reworked documents they've been um, revised relatively recently they um they do demonstrate um, and illustrate um, best practice um, and they're free for anybody to download. So we're we're very transparent. The association, all our technical documents are there and open for anybody to look at, criticize, use, um, abuse, whatever you want to do. They're all there. So please feel free to go and have a look at those. Uh, in the background, um, you can see um, one of our pet dry rot colonies. Unfortunately, we managed to kill this by overwatering it in the end. Um, but this was this was given us to us by by Ross Charter to complete preservation, um, and we kept it alive and kept feeding it for for. for a couple of years before before we eventually um, neglected it and it died as I say because we we kind of overwatered it not underwatered it now one of the things that um, that, that, that that I'm you know I've got the stage so I'm allowed to be a little bit self-indulgent um, I, I, I brought up this issue um, I wrote an article off the back of a request from um, not really an request but a conversation I had with um, Alan from the our PSA uh, a couple of weeks ago and really opened up a bit of a can of worms. We are seeing more questions about spray foam insulation. Um, I personally am not an advocate of it for a lot of for a number of different reasons and certainly if you're interested go and search out that article it's on LinkedIn I think we put it out as well um, but spray foam holds water spray foam can sometimes um, uh, result in interstitial condensation it, it, it in, in every way it's counterproductive to if in my own view it's counterproductive to the to, to the protection and the, the 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 holding that timber in that state between growth and decay we have to keep timber dry we have to keep it out of the clutches of insects and fungus to keep it healthy. Spray foam insulation can, in some circumstances, tip the balance. And that's the thing that makes me most, most concerned about spray foam insulation. So the reason I'm bringing this up and I'm being indulgent now is that we are probably going to think about doing some research into this because that was the challenge really from our PSA. Is there any science to back your, to back your protestations? Well, there are anecdotes. Then there's certainly science around decay, but there's been very little work, it would appear, to really understand what's happening behind spray foam insulation once it's applied in normal domestic situations where real people are living in real buildings and producing moisture, where roofs are leaking or whether they're going through their normal winter summer cycling. So hopefully we're going to do some of that. Um, so it would be great to do this presentation again in a couple of, or another presentation like this in a couple of years and describe um, perhaps that we've um, discovered that there is scientific evidence to back some of our um, reservations about applying foam directly to roof timbers in the way that it's being done at the moment in the interests of energy saving. And don't get me wrong, I am a great advocate of, of kind of trying to reduce carbon use and, and, and uh, reduce carbon um, emissions and, and, and saving energy. But 
we have to do that in a way that's safe and sustainable and is not going to destroy our investments and our properties. So um, Andy said this was a grumpy man and didn't like it because he said it was grumpy. This I put up because this is you know, sort of represents me most of the time, slightly bewildered and not really knowing what's going on. Um, yes, perhaps a bit grumpy too. Um, I stole and, 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 and cajoled images from the following companies. So thank you all to them um, and to anybody else that I've missed too. Um, I think, Andy, I've finished after 45 minutes, which is what you asked for. Um, so happy to answer any questions that come from um, come from the audience. Thank you very much indeed for, for taking the time to listen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you did as well, Steve. Bang on time. Um, uh, do you know, I have to say, do you know, some of those pictures were really cool, actually. Another one I particularly loved. I loved that one that had the mycelium, the one that had the kind of weeping stuff that was coming through. I mean, that was something else. I mean, it actually reminds me of something, but I can't actually think what it is. But some really cracking pictures there. Also, by the way, just to let you know, just if you've been a passionate man about dry rot, I believe Brian Hindle has just sent you up a new email address, dryrot at hotmail.com. So, Brian, I think you can feel free to ping it over to Steve now. But well, got, well no, 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 I have to say that Brian's Brian's handle for years has been dry rot. Um, he uses that on his own blogs. Um, and I know that Brian is, is somebody that's equally as kind of passionate and enthralled by all the things that we see in our industry. And I, I read his material with um, with interest whenever he posts. He had, had something the other day about or this week about wall ties in Leeds, which, you know, my own hometown and, and, and I'm familiar with the building he's working on. But uh, no, I, I, unfortunately, I have changed all my passwords, but most of my most of my private passwords used to involve dry rot at some point as well. But I can tell you that now because they don't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, guys, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to go on to questions. Um, I don't have a huge amount of questions, so folks, if you want to pose a question, now well, let me, is the time. Andy, let me let, let me let me jump in. You can start thinking about that. I'm I'm looking at the chat, Avril. Um, can you take spores home? Yes, you can. You can take them home in Tupperware, and you can you can give them to the kids on it, you know, to play with. Without, we don't. But the fact is that unless conditions are right, you have no worries about bringing spores home. If you have conditions that are correct and 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 suitable for for dry rot growth, then the dry rot spores that you bring home on your clothes are not actually going to change the, the the spore loadings enough for it to be that significant. If you've got conditions that are correct for dry rot growth in your building, then dry rot will find it anyway. And and the influence of what you do in your day job is not going to have a massive difference. If if it if if that had been the case, then every house that I've ever lived in and every house that I've ever visited would probably have fallen down by now because you know, I spent days and days and days in my professional career um, working up in, in Yorkshire and um, poking around buildings with, with, with dry rot. Um, I used to find them. I used to search them out. I used to go and roll around in the stuff. And I've never had dry rot in my house. What? You just stole my thunder there, Steve. I was about to ask you that. But hopefully, hopefully both Mike, Petra, um, Avril, that helps answer your question. And I know there was a couple others that were posing that question at the same time as well. Steve, I'm going to start off with some email questions that came to us early on. I'm going to start okay, can, with... I, can I just pick up another one? It's, it's that bloody Hindle fella again. Um, <laughs> I, 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 he asked, do you need to irrigate walls for dry rot? Um, now, I, I'm not going to sit on the fence with this. Um, I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I have to say that our codes of practice as they're written now reflect this. Do you need to? Almost never is the answer is are there some circumstances where you may want to put herb, a, a, a fungicide into a masonry wall then yes but they are actually relatively few and far between our codes of practice and our codes of best practice and our guidance now do not recommend the mass irrigation of masonry walls with with herbicides what we do recommend is 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 programs of drying and understanding what you're doing about reinstatement um, it, it's 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 not necessarily good practice to introduce huge amounts of new water into a structure um, in a way that's kind of random. So so I'm not I'm not 
and we haven't as an organization and our membership have not been advocates of mass masonry irrigation on large scale but we do understand that in certain circumstances for good reasons there are that that there are justifications for for applying herbis uh, for applying fungicides and i keep getting that wrong herbicides to masonry Right. Do you know, I'm actually going to skip to a question just because you're talking about spraying, except this actually comes from Douglas. Um, he's mentioning that he has a client uh, who wants to have a 1850s roof spray treatment done as part of his insurance. Do you think that this policy is flawed? I don't actually... Uh, Douglas, are you trying to suggest there that he shouldn't be actually doing the spray treatment period because it's a 1950s house? I mean, Steve, what would you consider? Do you consider a sensible thing to do on a historic house? Um, I, I wouldn't care whether it was a house built in 1984 or whether it was a house built in 1684. I would not coat the underside of the roof coverings and the timbers with 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 an adhesive foam. I just wouldn't do it. Why would you do that? Um, as I said in that little bit of article that I've written, no spay foam ever stopped the roof coverings deteriorating outside any quicker. Um, it was originally sold not as an insulant, but a stabilization material for, for roofs that were failing. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is, however, that if those roofs fail and you get a slip slate, it, it, that still happens. If if it gets in behind that 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 material, the foam holds the water against uh, against the timbers even a bit. You run the risk of accelerated decay. Why would you why would you spray that gunk against against any wood in any building in any circumstances? Somebody might well come up with an answer to that. But if you're asking me my own personal opinion, um, just don't do it. Why would you? Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm going to jump back to just some email questions that came to. Is this uh, first question from Peter Suter? Oh, hang on just a second. Douglas has come back. I wasn't referring to spray foam. I was all talking about fungicide. Um, OK, I, I, again, this is this is not just a personal opinion. It's found its way into the codes of practice. I struggle with the justification for applying fungicides to timber. If you've got a decay problem, then it's because you have too much water. The addition of a fungicide to those timbers is not going to change your water problem. It's just going to add a preservative that's going to give you a temporary buffer to the growth of, of some, 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 some fungus. Um, as a contractor, and this goes back quite a long time, I, I stopped using herb, uh, fungicides on otherwise okay timber. It, 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 it to me it was pointless what it also did was set up an expectation from a client that because i'd use a dual purpose insecticide fungicide or a fungicide on a piece of timber that i was going to extend the guarantee that that timber wouldn't rot for the next 20 or 30 years well i can't do that i i can only tell you that that timber is going to be okay if it remains in its in its in its natural air dry state if it gets wet it's going to rot and all the fungicide i can pour on it is not going to change that so um, Douglas, to get to your question, personally, I would not apply proactively fungicides to timbers as a spray, as a as a means to eradicate a problem or to head one off. Atmospheric uh, it, it, manipulation and 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 creating a healthy atmosphere or conditions for that timber to survive in is 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 what I would advocate. It's not it's not that preactive uh, preemptive. Uh, application of of, of 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 preservatives all right well steve here i'm just going to because we'll still get quite a few questions to rattle through and i'm conscious of time so if you're able to make the question uh, the answers a bit short that would be grand but i'm going to start back at the email questions first one from peter Suter is referring to historic buildings here um, a lot of historic buildings use timber that are 100 to 200 years old most of which He's suggesting is Baltic pine. Um, can you suggest what modern timbers are available to be used in these buildings for repair? Can you um, just use anything? Well, you can use anything you want, but it's crap. Oh. Um, the, 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 the fact is that you can buy pretty much anything. You just need deep pockets. 
um and 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 you know my my, my friend and colleague jervis um sawyer um is is somebody that knows where everything is so you know mm -hmm. somehow he he knows where um everything from um baltic pine to um to 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 to, to, to greenheart lives um and there are timber merchants that can supply this stuff but it ain't cheap um, mm. The trouble is at the moment, you're asking me for a short answer. I, I hate short answer questions. I know, um, I know. But, but the fact is, the fact is that the, the, the gunk that we're getting mm. into the country at the moment um, is, is a lot of it is really fast grown timber, really low durability, um, actually not that good. But actually, it's probably all we can get at the moment in a lot of cases. Um, and so you have to you have to work with what you what you have. But if you have a specific requirement for um, for 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 a particular type of timber with a particularly dura particularly particular durability um then you can find it you just have to pay mm. for it okay I, I have to say that just as an add-on um that was one of my terrible traits as a contractor and still I, I struggle to get over it now as i can't drive past a skip with timber in it without stopping and filling the car um <laughs> Because okay. the timber we throw away is mm. often far better than the timber we can buy. <laughs> and that just goes to show the love that we have for wood at the PCA. But uh, yeah, uh, moving on, uh, next email question came from uh, Katie Southford, um, who's referencing trough rafters here. She's asking, with trough rafters being presumably pre-treated before fitted, um, is it a case that they won't be affected by rot? Um, <laughs> they will be affected by rot if they get wet enough for long enough. Um, and actually, yeah, you know, the, the, some some trust rafters are great, um, but trust rafters are relatively modern. They sit in relatively modern roofs. They 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 they're probably to some degree relatively well protected. Um, I can tell you that I've got trust rafters in my nineteen seventies built house um i recently a couple of years ago built an extension um mm. it meant pulling the fascia and the soffits off one corner that had been badly badly exposed and i can tell you the star feet on the trough rafters and the wall plate were, were there was some rot in them now it wasn't a big deal to rain, change and replace them but 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 factory pre-treatment of a piece of timber that was installed up there 30 40 years ago is no um is no guarantee that you won't get decay um nature has a wonderful way of, of 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 getting around our best intentions and the fact is if you take timber which is friable and uh, and likely to decay um those chemical treatments cannot permanently 100 percent prevent by by deterioration of that of that timber um you know it's it's just another attempt to keep timber in that in that in that gap between growth and rot um it, it's not perfect it can't be relied on to, to to kind of you know to replace good maintenance good construction and dryness well folks just to let you know we are running just slightly over time i think we're maybe just be about five minutes or so so if you can just stick with us steve next question to you interesting question actually can wet rot turn into dry rot or vice versa can cats turn into dogs <laughs> <laughs> oops <laughs> can my children turn into reasonably nice well-balanced human beings that don't give me a hard time um probably the answer to all those questions is is no apart from the last one but we you know we keep working on the kids mm. um absolutely not dry rot cannot turn into wet rot they're two completely mm. different things um uh, it, it, what you can have is a situation and circumstances that are right for a for a wet rot growth and over time those conditions can change and those conditions can then be correct and right for dry rot growth but one can't turn into the other oh there you go uh next question next question comes from dan Heard. um is it safe to dry buildings with dry rot considering you will be introducing forced air about the building and therefore moving the spores around Okay, the, the, 
there's there's a whole bunch of assumptions there that just make me head mm. scratch me head. The oh. first thing is that drying does not necessarily mean that you're forcing air into anywhere. But if you want to mm. use forced air and you want to use forced drying and you want to use heaters and all the rest of it, that's one perfectly legitimate way, way of drying masonry. The the flood the flood recovery industry have been doing it for years and they're pretty good at it. The fact is, however, that the spores don't matter. You forget about this whole issue of spore loadings. Again, it's the conditions that the spores need to germinate that are the important thing. If you think that a house that's got rampant dryer on it hasn't got spores blowing around all over the place, if it's got fruit bodies um, there, then 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 you're you're sadly deluded. They're already there. If you're going to then put a put a dryer on it, then the chances are you'll have pulled the fruiting bodies off first anyway. Um, and thrown those, got rid of those. Um, you're going to dry the masonry down. The masonry is all you're going to do is is put more of the spores that are already in the, in the air into the air. You're also going to open the windows um, to let that hot, moist air out. You're going to have some exhaust system, so you're going to take as many spores out of the window as you are going to recirculate them in the building. But they're already there, mate. They're already in the building. Mm. So it's about conditions for growth. It's about conditions for germination. It's not about whether they're present or not, because they already are. Cool. Well, the last question I'm going to hit you with um, comes from John Telford, and it's actually associated with bats. Now, John, I'm just going to tell you, we are planning a webinar coming up in the, the next month or two that's bat related. So keep your ears out for uh, that. Um, I'm sorry, keep your ears. You can tell I've not had enough coffee. But the question is, um, John was surveying a property in Lancashire for wood rot recently and he came across a bat roost. What is your general advice towards treating timber problems with bats in the area? Of all the questions, you had to choose that one, didn't you? <laughs> I, have to, I actually have to think about this. Um, well, not really. Well, um, the main if you've got, if you've got you know, it's, it's very straightforward. The, <laughs> yeah. the thing is that if you've got a bat roost, then essentially, mm. you know, the, the law is that you can't disturb the bat roost. Um, mm. you, 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 and you mustn't. And it's the right thing to do. It's not just because it's the law. It's because it's the right morally and, and, and you know, and every for every other reason, it's the right thing to do. So if you can't undertake your inspection fully without disturbing the bat roost, then you have to get some help from from the authorities, the Bat Conservation Trust, or one of the other um, the, the the other uh, authorized people that can give you some advice or help you work in, in an area where there is a bat roost. If if it is decided that there is a requirement for some form of treatment or disturbance in order to do that, then actually it's not me you need to seek advice from. It's the people that, that, that can provide you that advice and give you the green light to, to do the work. There are some um, pesticides that are recognized as being safe to use around bat roosts, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, because the primary legislation is not about herbicides and squirting stuff. It's about disturbance. So it's the process mm. of doing the work as much as it is the material that you're going to put on that's controlled and that has to be done sensitively and sensibly in order not to disturb or to move on or to damage or to kill the bats. So um, mm. it, it, it's, it's a very quick answer to what could be a quite a complicated answer, a quick, quick answer to what is a kind of a, a much more in-depth question. Um, if you've got a bat roost, get some professional help. There's lots of people out there. And my experience is that most of these um, volunteers that work for these organizations are incredibly helpful, very engaging. They want to work with you. They don't want to just mm. be obstructive. So engage with them, um, work with them, and generally you can come to, a, to, 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 to the correct solution. And as I mentioned, John, listen out for the webinar being announced, um, I think it's in two, um, it's not the next one, but the one after that. So yeah, just visit our webinars page at just www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. So folks, um, you heard station it earlier on. If you are looking for any kind of additional information, there is a code of practice and guiding docs, guidance docs available for you. You can just go to our technical library the link is on the screen there but you can also um go into our professional section get some additional kind of guidance and advice and there and plus on top of that as well the webinar today will be available to everyone tomorrow at some point and it will just be automatically emailed out um, for those that are interested in learning a bit more there is some training courses that are available to you first place i want to point you to is to our 
new online surveyor training course for da timber and dampness in buildings. Uh, we also have support training courses as well for technicians. Um, these are two day workshops, um, but we also have on top of that as well, our safe use of biocides for professional users. Um, for anyone that wants to check out the training courses or gain any kind of additional kind of learning, the link is on the screen there. It's just www.property-care.org forward slash training. Um, just before we go, just to let you know, next webinar that's coming up, we're switching now to more looking at basement waterproofing and structure waterproofing. Next webinar being all about building regulations for basement conversions. This is looking at how do building regulations affect basement waterproofing and conversion projects and when do they become applicable? So uh, to find out more, visit our website. Again, the link's up there, www.property-care.org forward slash webinars. And that is on the 22nd of July. Um, last but not least, I just want to say Firstly, a uh, big thank you to Steve for coming on uh, with the presentation. I want to say a big thank you to everyone that joined us this morning and kept with us, even though we're a little bit late. And lastly, but not least, I just want to say to everyone, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. So goodbye, everyone, and thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, lots of lots of friends and colleagues so, sort of on the thing. It's nice to know you're all out there having fun. Um, but thanks, everybody. I'll see you in eight months, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. <Yeah. laughs>